In this video we're going to look at environmental policies, specifically policies that are designed to reduce uh, negative externalities associated with pollution. Let's start with our um, very familiar graph of uh, the marginal cost to produce a product Q um, and we're going to assume that the firm uh, receives a price P that does not change um, over the quantity. All right, so the firm is going to be uh, producing up until the point where its marginal cost is equal to the price, uh, providing marginal net benefits equal to the distance between the price and the quantity. Now, since we want to talk about pollution, we're going to switch um, the graph and we're going to take the 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 figure here. We've got the um, the graph that we just looked at at the top, and then below it, we're going to assume that for every unit of of the good Q, there's a unit of pollution that's pr um, produced. Um, so uh, since the firm actually is getting marginal benefits, marginal net benefits from the production of the um, the good, uh, it's implicitly also getting marginal net benefits from the production of uh, pollution. Um, and so the uh, optimal level of pollution for this firm is going to be uh, POM. Now we can look at, the, at this also in terms of our, uh, in the, on the graph at the top where we've got a, uh, the quantity and then we've got a marginal external cost. So we've just um, recreated a marginal cost of society, which is just the marginal private cost plus the marginal external cost. And that's just rise, raising uh, this marginal cost of society curve up. Now it's frequently convenient to think this in, of this marginal external cost not as the marginal external cost, but specifically the marginal damage cost associated with the pollution. So let's do the same thing that we did for the producer side of things and move this down into pollution space here. So we've said, all right, for each unit of the of the good Q, one unit of pollution is created, and now our marginal damage cost is the area, the distance, the vertical distance between the marginal cost um, to the firm, the P, and the marginal cost to society. And so that is uh, a slight upward sloping curve, as you can see that this, uh, these two um, curves are getting further and further uh, apart from each other. Um, so uh, now we put the, the two uh, curves together for the firm and for society, and we get uh, that the marginal net benefits to the firm are downward sloping here. The marginal damage cost is upward sloping, while the private optimum is, is achieved at PO subscript M. Uh, the optimal would be achieved where um, the first equimarginal principle is, is satisfied, and that is that PO star, where the marginal net benefits to the firm is equal to the marginal damage cost. We can also look at this in terms of our more familiar graph um, for the externalities, where we've shifted the marginal cost of society of producing this good Q, and now where that is equal to the price, that's going to give us the social optimum. So basically, you can think about the goal of society is how do we get um, an economy to move from POM back to some point PO star. And we're going to look at three main types of policy options. The first option is what we call command and control. Now, theoretically, this is the easiest um, approach. We simply say, I'm sorry, folks, you're going to have to stop at PO star. Uh, the government might go in and, and use a, a set of policies designed to, to restrict the quantity of pollution that is emitted. Um, that requires an awful lot of knowledge, but if you've got the knowledge, you can actually move us um, back from POM back to PO star, an efficient outcome. The problem is that it's usually the case that uh, that the government does not have the kind of information, and as we'll su see later, uh, how you impose that on heterogeneous firms becomes really difficult. The second policy option is to put a tax on pollution. So in this case we've um, set the tax equal to T and we've told the firms that for every unit um, of uh, pollution that you create you're going to have to pay this tax. Now you'll see that the marginal net benefits to the firm is not the whole distance from the marginal net benefit curve down to zero but it stops at, at a tax because they have to pay this tax and so their marginal net benefit curves marginal net benefit is actually now smaller and you'll see that the marginal net benefit to the firm hit zero at PO star, which is our socially optimal level. We can also um, show how this tax would play out in a um, in our 
uh, externality uh, figure and so here we've got a tax which is uh, one dollar tax or uh, this distance here the tax for each unit of production since every unit of production yields one unit of pollution that simply shifts our cost of producing upward by that amount and again if the tax is set exactly right uh, you can move that um, production cost curve upward just a tiny bit until you get to the point where the um, uh, intersection of the marginal cost to the firm plus the tax crosses the price at exactly PO star achieving the socially optimal level. So a tax can achieve a um, the socially optimal level of pollution. We can also do that by means of a subsidy and the subsidy looks at bas basically the same. So in this case we say alright here's the initial firm's level of pollution um, and they uh, if they reduce their level of pollution below that, the government's going to give them some money. And we're going to say that that money is equal to S dollars per unit of pollution that they abate or they reduce. All right. So you know, what this means is that for the firm, their marginal cost curve is actually shifted up by exactly the same amount. Now, why is it that the marginal cost curve is shifting up if we've given them a subsidy? Well, the reason is that every time that they produce a unit of the of this good they are giving up a dollar uh, or an s um, dollars in in the subsidy so a because the subsidy creates an opportunity cost to the firm they actually uh, their marginal cost to produce has actually shifted up and again they will produce up until the point where their marginal net benefits is equal to the um, price p0 star uh, leading to the socially optimal outcome. So we can either achieve um, a, the socially optimal outcome by means of a tax or a subsidy in very much the same way. The last set of policies that we're going to present here real quickly is the idea of a, a trading um, program or a, a cap and trade program which you may have heard about in the news. In order to do this we're going to switch um, gears a little bit more and, and move from pollution to pollution abatement. So if the firm were producing um, P0M uh, units of pollution that would be equivalent to zero units of abatement um, and as they increase, they if they if they were to increase their abatement to move their pollution all the way back to zero then we'd achieve P0M units of abatement. Um, so our, we have a marginal abatement cost which is simply the mirror image of our marginal net benefit curve um, up here. Now the, the real action that, that takes place in a tradable permits program is if we have marginal abatement costs for multiple firms. We have different firms competing um, for who gets to or who is going to um, uh, reduce the pollution and the real magic occurs is if these um, firms have different level, different marginal abatement cost curves. So you'll notice that the marginal abatement cost curve for the first firm is steeper uh, than that for the second firm. Now suppose that we start out with a, a situation where both firms are told they need to abate their pollution by the same amount. So our, our initial level of, of abatement by firm one, A1, is the same as the additional level, initial level of abatement by firm two, A2. But we see very easily that it we can actually do better. We can actually reduce the costs of abating. If we trade it a little bit, that is, firm one reduces the amount that they um, abate and firm two increases the amount that they abate, we can actually achieve the same um, level of total uh, abatement but do it at slightly lower cost. All right? And so how do you accomplish that? Well, if we imagine a market in the rights to um, pollute, well in this case if we had a price at PA, the, the abatement price, all right, you'll see that the firm one would choose to buy the right to pollute more, pollute more um, up until the point where their marginal abatement cost is equal to that price PA. Firm two would choose to um, uh, be willing to abate more and be paid the price PA to abate up until the point that their price um, or their marginal abatement cost is equal to that price PA. Um, and therefore, um, the result is that the uh, total 
uh, abatement is the same. We've got A1 plus A2 is the same as A1 star plus A2 star, but we've reduced our cost. All right? And if you just take this, the savings to firm 1 and subtract from that the additional cost to firm 2, that give, tells us how much uh, the two firms together have saved. Uh, both firms are better off than at the original standard where A1 was equal to A2, um, and uh, the society as a whole is better off because we've, re we've reduced the total cost to achieve uh, a pollution reduction outcome. So those are the three main options that economists talk about in terms of pollution policy, command and control, taxes, and tradable permits. And these are all used in different real-world scenarios uh, and uh, they should, um, you'll see them come up repeatedly in chapter 15.